Hi everybody, I'm Greg. I'm here to talk to you about mead, the ancient history, how it's made, the lore, and much more. Now most people think that mead comes from these guys. Sorry about that. I meant these guys. Vikings didn't wear horns on their head because they needed it for something else. Vikings were one of the many, many cultures that had honey wine as one of their main drinks. Around 9,000 years ago, the world's oldest alcoholic drink was discovered in Jaihu village in the Yellow River Valley in Henan province. It's dated back in the Neolithic era. Way, way back in a long time ago before we became actual structured civilized cultures and started actually cultivating of crops, making it our main staple and replacing the hunter and gatherers. One of the coolest myths I came along about mead was how mead came to humans from Odin. Yes, the Viking god. And it all started when these two lovebirds met. Freya and Odin. Yes, Viking god who's the Asir, Asir, Vanir, which she was a prominent member. And she basically comes up to him and all his people and says, Hey, how you guys all doing and stuff like that. She's adorned herself in gold to make herself look more prominent and stuff like that. And they basically get jealous of her and they kill her three times. And each time they throw her in a fire. Each time she gets out of the fire. Now she gets pissed off, storms back to Vanir. Vanir show up and that's when it gets interesting. Now the Vanir show up to Asgard in might using their spells, which they were good at, and that's what Freya was really good for us too, and they destroyed the walls of Asgard, which waiting there was an Asgardian army with Odin waiting there with his spear, and he throws it into the host of the Vanir, and the first war starts. Each side rended upon each other, destroying mass amounts of people rendering everything useless and destroyed upon them. Both sides seeing that this was inevitable that neither one will be able to win. They decided to make a truce and therefore bought her some hostage. The Vanyar give up Njord, his two children Frey and Freya. The Aesir gave up Mimir and Honir, which basically the Vanyar got mad and thought they got cheated because Honir couldn't make up his mind very well. So they basically, in retaliation, chopped off Mimir's head and handed it back to Odin. To stop further bloodshed, all the gods decided together in peace that they had spit in a giant cauldron together, and there they made a man called Kvasir, the wise and the most intelligent being in the planet. Now, Kvasir was wise beyond his known, the most intelligent being of all things, because all the gods portrayed, put everything into him, literally everything but he basically went around the lands and then he met these two dwarves Thaljalar and Galar and they basically killed him drained his blood mixed it with some honey and turned it into the mead of poetry now the two dwarves come along one day and they meet Gillinger and his wife right they're two giants well they basically the uh giant, Gilliger, wants to go sailing with them, right? And they're talking and having a grand day, and the ocean capsizes their boat. Well, Gilliger drowns, right? The two brothers swim back to shore. Now they're trying to talk to the wife and say, oh my God, we're so sorry, but she's wailing and wailing and wailing. So one of the brothers basically comes up and hits her in the head with a gigantic rock and crushes her dead. Okay. Her son... This guy, Suntiger, gets pissed off when he hears about this and then basically storms up, grabs them, puts them on this reef and threatens to drown them if he doesn't give up their mead. Now, Suntiger gives the mead to his daughter, Gunload, for protection, where she puts it in a cave and then that's where she meets Odin. Who now Suntiger Sutunger okay. and now Suntiger he basically gives it to his daughter Gunload 
to protect for him and why he goes off and does things that giants like to do. Then she meets Odin. Yes, Odin. Now, Odin spends three days and nights with her for a drink of each one of the three pots the mead of poetry is in. Little did she know, because she was smitten with him, that basically the little sip that she bargained for basically was draining each one of the pots. Now, his belly is filled with the meat of poetry, and it's now time to go. Now, Suntagur comes home, sees what's happened, sees his daughter, you know, have the fun, and then a little while. After Suttagar comes home, sees what's happened, sees Odin, Odin saying Arrivederci, flies off as a falcon, while Suttagar starts and forms himself into a massive eagle and flies after him. Well, Odin's pretty full and he's not flying very fast compared to this huge eagle coming up after him. So what does he do? He starts spitting and spitting and spitting that meat out so he could get a little bit more speed. Now, the people below... The, the humans on Midgard and the elves and the gods all are sharing this mead that he's spitting out, right? And then the Vani, or the Azir see him coming, see what's happening. And they basically throw out all these pots for him so he could just dump all of it out as he's flying. Now, they basically set up an ambush and they set up a house on fire and boom, the giant is dead. Another was a very large and powerful magician. The third plague was caused by two dragons fighting. He went over to Gaul, France, to get advice from his brother, King Lithis, who gave him insects to deal with the Corneades, gave him advice on how to deal with the magician, and then gave him advice on how to deal with the dragons. King Lud found out that the one dragon was an alien dragon attacking one dragon that lived in Britain. They fought and fought and fought while the king, as they were doing this, decided to dig a giant pit and filled it with mead. Now, the dragons being thirsty and tired and also very greedy, they both dove towards the pit fighting the entire time until they turned themselves into piglets and landed in the mead. As they were drinking it up, the king wrapped them up in a blanket threw them in one of the most securest places in his kingdom and put a gigantic stone over the top and you can still see it today. It was even stated that the great Achilles was even anointed on his birth with mead. Now bees, mead, and honey have been in religion and our cultures for the longest of times from ancient Islam to ancient Buddhists to Rosh Rahashana to Hinduism, to Christianity, even to ancient Egypt. Honey has been in our lives, culture, religions. In Hinduism, each man of Avatara, or the age of Manu, which is the chief or first man, was given me down from the heavens to enlighten all the kings and princes of the land. When Ra weeps again, the water which flows from his eyes upon the ground turns into working bees. They work in the flowers and the trees, and every kind and wax and honey become into being. In ancient Egypt, even Imhotep, not that Imhotep, this Imhotep, not only did he use it for numerous religious ceremonies, he used it in his medical practice as well. What is honey? Now everyone knows that honey comes from a bee's butt, right? Or, or is it bee vomit? What is honey? Now this cute little guy right here takes his tongue, sticks it down, starts sucking up the nectar. Now as she's sucking the nectar up into her through her tongue, her salivary glands are excreting some enzymes to help break down that nectar. Enzymes are inversus, and vardas uh, breaks down it into two different sugars. 
amylase makes the honey sweeter and then glucose oxidide actually stabilizes the ph balance in that honey now this is where the forager bee is going to be bringing her stash in her stomach now she's also got little pollen sacs on her legs but she's going to cruise into her home with all her thousands and thousands of sisters. this is where she'll hand it off to her sisters and then she's basically going to fill those little sacks up or the comb up then she's going to take off again and then her sisters are going to come along suck that up and then they're basically going to excrete the same exact enzymes take it to another one their sisters are going and then they're going to put it into one of the other honeycombs one of their sisters are going to come along do the same thing and then all meanwhile they're fanning and basically evaporating all the water that's out of the nectar which is about 80 percent when it starts and they're going to drop it down to about 20 percent by the time it's all done and set now nature's little helpers need our help to keep them alive beekeepers around america reported a 40 percent drop in their percentage of beehive as you see some countries don't have any bees hardly at all and now some countries do report a boom in their populations but a lot of them it's where the pesticides are happening are killing off your bees one of the great ways that people are trying to keep these little guys alive is rooftop beekeeping but just make sure that you also plant some gardens along with it so before you actually start one of those hives up call your city hall and make sure that you actually can start one up because there might be an ordinance preventing it so how do you make mead water yeast what you're also going to need is my recipe for five gallons of mead is one gallon of honey two tablespoons of yeast, and four gallons of water. You're gonna need a few other things. One is something to put it in, like a glass jug, or this is a demijohn one gallon, or you could go up to a five gallon and then larger. This is a triple scale hydrometer. This will tell you your gravity readings, how much sugar is in your must, and when it's done fermenting. You're gonna need a tube. I marked mine so I don't overspill when I put the hydrometer in there. And it's a good idea to give it a little spin as you put it in to shake off any tiny little bubbles for proper reading. You're gonna need a thermometer. This will help tell when your mead is actually fermenting at the proper temperature and not, and it's not gonna die from it being too hot. Now, if you don't got a home brewery store near you, you can go to a pet store and pick some of these up and strap them to the outside of your jugs. But you should really get some of the ones from the home brewery stores. Now you're gonna need a few chemicals. One is pectin enzyme. Put this into your mead before you start to ferment to help break down the fruit cells when you're from flavoring. Some sodium metabisulfate to kill wild yeast before you start making your mead and then after you're done fermenting to kill the rest of the yeast. You will need some nutrients. This is dimonium phosphate, which will help the yeast growth when you're making your wort. Potassium sorbate is to help stabilize the mead after it's been done fermented and the yeast is killed, so it's perfect for aging. And I use sparkloid, which is a fining agent, help clarifies your mead. These are autosiphons, and they help suck out the mead from your jug, which is the term called racking. You're gonna need some airlocks. The round ones are for fermentation, the other kind are after fermentation, and I do use a little bit of liquor inside those, like rum or vodka, just so you can kill off any incoming germ. You're gonna need something to make the must in. I'm gonna add some dimonium phosphate to the lukewarm water, just so I could get it dissolved faster and easier. Then I'll add some yeast to kickstart the fermentation process. I'm gonna add the pectic enzyme and the sodium metabisulfate before I add water. You want to warm your honey up prior to using it so it's easier to use. Now if you don't got a giant jug or a pot to make the must in, you can always just grab another jug, fill it with water and with the honey, shake it really good, make sure that it puts a lot of oxygen into that must because the yeast needs oxygen to make that alcohol. Now after yeast is bloomed, I put it in there and then I will stir the yeast in really really well Make sure I stir it up really hard to get the bubbles going and to thoroughly incorporate the yeast throughout the must. Now I'm going to take an airlock and I can put that on there right away. But for the first few days, I do like to cover it so that the oxygen can flow really well. 
Or you could just put your airlock in and you're good to go. Now you want to rack off some of the must so you can tell the potential alcohol. Now I set mine to a preset limit so I know how much that's not going to overfill. Now spin your little hydrometer to get all the tiny little air bubbles off. Now you want to write down what your levels are so you can know what your potential alcohol level is. Then fill it back in. Make sure you clean up after yourself because you don't want those ants coming in. Now I'll take the stocking and put that over the top and that way the little fruit flies if they show up won't get into the actual airlock. Now I place mine somewhere where I know it's going to be warm but not too hot or too cold exposed to the elements. I'm going to stir this up to make sure that the yeast is alive and then I will let it go for uh, about a day and then stir it every day for you know the two weeks. And if it's bubbling it's fermenting. Now you're going to start racking your mead for the very first time to get off all the leads that are out of the bottom of your jug. Then you add sodium metabolic sulfite so you can kill what living yeast is still in your mead and then I immediately add the honey to back sweeten it and then whatever yeast is living in that honey will immediately die going into the mead. This will make sure the fermentation process does not restart. I'm going to get my fining agent, which is sparkloid, ready. I'm going to boil a cup of water with a few teaspoons of it in there for about five minutes. And then you're going to add it to the mead hot. Make sure you stir it. You want to set it somewhere where it's not going to be disturbed for at least two weeks for the sparkloid to take effect and then gelatinize down onto the bottom of the bottle. Now you'll rack off the from the top and get ready for the bottling. This is where you'll add your potassium sorbate to stabilize your mead. You're going to need some bottles to put it in. You're going to need a corker. This one is a handheld device and it shows you when it's actually charged with the cork. You're also going to need some polyurethane sleeves and cork. I use my Wagner heat gun to melt the sleeves over the corks to seal the bottles. You want to get some water boiling and then put your corks inside the boiling water so they can cook for just a few minutes. That way they're easier to go in and into the bottle. Before you bottle, though, you want to make sure you degas your mead so you can get rid of all that excess air. Now you can either rack your mead into bottles or use a wine pump. Since I'm a big guy, I can actually just take my jug, pour it into a pitcher, and then pour it into the bottles. As you see, I'm using a bunch of demijohns as well as some bottles. That way I can bulk age instead of just bottle age. When you bulk age, you want to fill it up as much as you can and leave very little headspace. I will fill these up with about 750 milliliters of mead or up to the bottom of the neck. Now you want to pay attention to the levels of mead inside your bottles because once you start putting the corks in, if there's not enough air space, they will pop right. This is where I'll grab my heat gun and start melting the sleeves and make them look nice and neat. And I slowly spin them to make it a little bit easier. More that way the sleeves don't warp. I prefer to bulk age my mead instead of bottle because if you bottle age, you can see a big line of sediment builds up on the bottom of your bottles. Bulk aging, that's not going to be that much of a problem because you'll be able to rack it off a lot easier than actually having to pour it off in a bottle. Now before you go get all your supplies and all your stuff, you should take a quick trip to your home brewery supply store. Now, if you're in the Western Washington area, you should travel down to Fife to John's store and talk to him. He's a really smart guy and really, really nice. I'll be putting his links in the description and the link to his video. If you're in Washington State, the best honey I have ever farmed in Lakewood, Washington. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you found it very entertaining and very informative. Now, one of the biggest things I was doing this for was to save the bees. They are basically becoming endangered and we need to save them to save us. So much stuff revolves around those little boogers, but also very important mead. So just remember every time you raise a glass or you eat a little bit of that honey, Make sure that you give thanks to those little guys that are roaming around there and, you know, that gave us all of the legends and everything else. So I hope you guys will subscribe, 
hit that like button down there and tell your friends about me and check me out on my Facebook accounts and all my other stuff and check out my links. You guys have a great day. Bye-bye.